My name is Scotty James. It's good to be with you. I'm excited to get into the Word of God with you a little bit. And when I say get into the Word of God, I, I, don't, mean, I don't mean I'm excited to read Bible content with you. It's not what I mean. The point, I always want to put this in front of us, the point of the Word of God is to behold the face of God. That's the point. The point of the word is to point us to the person. It's very easy to lose sight of that and to get stuck on the word, but to miss that the word is revealing a person behind it. So that's what we're trying to, that's what we're prayerfully seeking to do. Not just give you more content, academic content to fill your head with knowledge, but to understand who your God is, how he is, how he loves you, what your proper response to him is. That's, that's the spirit that we're trying to go after here. So I always want to keep that in front of us. Amen? Yeah. Okay, if you have a Bible, go to Luke chapter 15. Luke 15, verse, uh, we'll start off in verse 11. If you need a Bible, there's Bibles in the back. You can raise your hand and Usher will bring one to you. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, you can keep that. But Luke chapter 15, if you're using that Bible, it's on page 493. Luke 15, starting on verse 11. If you've been with us for the past several weeks, we've been looking at patterns of thinking that if they're adopted by us, they'll lead us to live contrary to who God made us to be. And the first belief we looked at last week was this idea that I won't have enough. If you believe that idea that I won't have enough to obey God, or that I don't have enough to obey God, it's going to lead you to live contrary to how God wants you to actually live. You'll adopt what's called a scarcity mentality, where you believe that scarce, uh, resources are scarce and, and hard to come by. And when you adopt that sort of mentality, you're gonna, be, you're gonna feel fear when it comes to resources. You're gonna be afraid to be generous. You're probably gonna be more stingy. You're gonna be less likely to, to take healthy risks because you're operating under a belief that's not true. The reality is, if you are a child of God, you will have enough because your father is your provider and he always provides for his children. He always funds his plans and covers his costs. And so you've got to, you've got to renew your mind away from that lie and toward the reality that, no, God does provide. He will provide. I should walk out these plans. Another belief we looked at last week that it will lead you to live contrary to who God made you to be was this idea that, what I have is mine. When you have that mentality that what you have is yours, you're not going to live how God made you to live. You're going to live under this idea that what I have is mine because I worked for it and I deserve it. And so since I deserve it, I have the right to do whatever I want with it because it's mine. Not true. What you have belongs to God and he has graciously entrusted it to you for you to use not for your purposes, but for his purposes and for his glory. But until you can recognize that faulty belief, you're not going to be living the way God made you to live. And so in the parable we're about to read, there's another mentality that if adopted by us will lead us to live contrary to who God made us to be. So I want to look at that for a few minutes. Luke chapter 15, verse 11. Are we there? Yeah. Say amen if we're there. Amen. Okay. Luke 15, verse 11. It reads, Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there he squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent did I already go past that? So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him into the feed, fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything to eat. I'll stop there. So to summarize, this is called the story of the prodigal son. And what happens is a wayward son goes off and, and leaves home and screws his life up, comes to his senses, comes back home, and the father goes above and beyond and welcomes him back and restores him to his place in the family. And the point of the parable is to reveal God. 
The point of the parable is to reveal that God has this loving, gracious, generous heart toward his children. That's the point. But there's also this underlying mentality, I think, comes through in this parable. If you were to look at the mentality of the son, you would see an entitled mentality. The son comes to the father and says, give me my stuff. Give me these resources. I am owed this stuff. And as a result of that faulty mentality, he lives a certain way. He becomes wasteful. He becomes unappreciative. He becomes very frivolous with those resources. And all of that came from a faulty mentality. And the same thing happens with us. If we adopt a faulty mentality or an entitlement mentality, believing that what we have we deserve, that we're owed things, that we're expecting things, we're going to live the same way. We're going to be frivolous with resources. You're going to be wasteful with resources. You're going to become unappreciative. You're going to become very enabled and entitled because you're operating under a belief that contradicts your reality. The reality is what you have is not yours and what you have is not deserved. So we've got to renew our minds if we want to not live that way. And this is what you need to renew your minds with. What I have is because God is gracious. That's the kingdom mentality we need to have. What I have is not because I deserve it. It is not owed to me. No, what I have is because God is gracious. I don't deserve this. I'm not owed anything. You can write down Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. Anybody know what that verse is? Say it like you mean it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Let me put a parenthesis there. Why? Because he's bored? Because he's lacking in something? No, because he's gracious. The very first sentence of the Bible explodes with the grace of God. God created the heavens and the earth because he's gracious. He didn't have to create the heavens and the earth. He wasn't, he wasn't lacking something in himself, and in response to that lack, he created the heavens and the earth. No, he created the heavens and the earth simply because of his grace and for his glory. God could, God could, could stop holding the earth together right now and be completely justified in doing that because he owes no man no thing, but he continues to hold everything together, and he continues to hold your life together simply because he's gracious. He's a gracious God, and until we can understand that, we're not going to handle his resources properly. We've got to have a kingdom mentality when it comes to resources. So going back to last week, a kingdom mentality approaches resources uh, a certain way, and if we have these core beliefs that are in alignment with the kingdom, we'll live how God made us to live. So there's a few core beliefs that a kingdom mentality holds. The first one is God is the provider of all. The second one was God always provides for himself. The third one was, what I have belongs to God. And then the one we just looked at was, what I have is because God is gracious. Believing those things and living according to those things will help us handle resources in a way that is consistent with what it means to be a child of God. All right, so we have our theology. Now let's make this practical. God is our provider. Cool. What is our part in that? Do we just sit back on our behinds and wait for God to feed us? Or how, how, does, this, how does this actually work? How do we receive God's provision? That's what I want to look at today. So let's start off. Let's go to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to take a stab at this. What is our part in God's provision? Matthew chapter 6. In verse, we'll start in verse 9. Matthew 6 verse 9. Jesus says, I might have to get some glasses. My eyes are going bad, babe. <laughs> Man. All right. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. All right, let's pause there. So Jesus is teaching his disciples how to pray, how they should communicate to God. And the first thing he says is our Father. In your notes, you should have that passage there. I want to encourage you to circle our Father. 
our Father. The first thing Jesus does is brings up identity. When you pray, pray our Father. That's intentional, I believe, because praying well starts with us understanding our relational connection to God. That's where it starts. Understand that he's your Father, which means two things. He's near to you and he's above you. He's near to you, he's above you. So it starts with understanding that, and then Jesus goes on and talks about some other things. He says, pray your kingdom come, your will be done. On earth as in heaven. And then he comes to this part where he says, give us this day our daily bread. I believe this is where Jesus is talking about the daily provisions that we need. Food, water, clothing, the, the material things that life, that, that's needed for life to be sustained. Circle that in your notes. Give us and circle daily bread. We're asking God for our needs. I believe that this, this statement by Jesus, the tone isn't meant to be a demand, and it's also not meant to be a, a, a pitiful plea. When he says, give us this day our daily bread, we're not demanding anything. It's not, God, give me my black eyed peas. Give me my food, my chicken. It's not that kind of tone. But it's also not, oh, oh God, can you please maybe spare a couple crumbs off your table? It's not this dictator and it's not this peasant. It's the tone of a respectful, humble, appreciative child. Remember, when Jesus talked about praying, he set the context of relationship from the get-go. And so as we approach our father, we approach him with humility, but we're also confident and expectant that he can and is able and is eager to provide for us. Why? Because he's father. He's above us but he's also near to us. I believe give us this day our daily bread is a way of acknowledging that God is our provider and he's able, but he's also eager to meet our needs. He's delighted. And so when it comes to waiting on God's provision, what our part is, here's to write down. The first part is to ask. Our part in receiving God's provision, it starts off with us asking. They say the closed mouth won't get fed. Ask. It's part of the process. But it's interesting. Look at what Jesus says right before the Lord's Prayer in verse 7. Matthew 6, 7, he says, And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think they'll be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Okay. Your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Why ask then? Think about that. If God knows what we need, what's the point of asking? I believe this is about three things. Identity, connection, and the heart of the Father. That's what's going on here. Identity, connection, and the heart of the Father. When you ask someone for something, you have to put yourself in a position of vulnerability. Anytime you ask, you are making yourself vulnerable. You are admitting that you are not self-sufficient. To ask is to admit that you need that other person. To ask is to admit that I'm reliant upon you, I'm dependent upon you. And this is why many of us don't want to ask for anything. We don't like being vulnerable. We don't like risking rejection. We don't like making ourselves dependent upon someone else. And yet Jesus right here says, this is how you should approach the Father. And I believe it's because God wants to cultivate a certain connection with his children. He wants to be vulnerable with him and humble before him and dependent upon him. And when we come to him asking, God is leading us into this this daily, uh, uh, day by day, even moment by moment dependence upon him. And that sort of atmosphere fosters a a strong relational connection. Okay, write down uh, Exodus chapter 16, verses 1 to 5. Exodus 16, verses 1 to 5, page 33, if you're following along in one of our Bibles. Say amen if we're there. Okay, we're not there yet. I'll give you another five seconds. Page 33, Exodus 16, 1 to 5. Say amen if we're there. Amen. All right, here we go. It says, the whole Israelite community set out from Elam and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elam Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they had come out of Egypt. 
In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted, but you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, they are to prepare what they are to bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. All right. So God told Israel to get the manna, get the bread every morning, and to not keep any of it overnight. Again, you ask the question, why? Why would God want them to gather the food every single day? It's not like the manna couldn't last overnight. In fact, on Friday nights, he made it in such a way where the manna would last so that they wouldn't have to gather on the Sabbath. So what is this? Why did God set it up to where they had to gather it every day? Again, I believe it's about a certain connection he's trying to foster with them. God wanted his children to walk in daily dependence on, them, on him. Every day they'd have to wake up trusting in daddy, trusting that daddy was going to provide. And this would require them to remain vulnerable before him and to keep trusting in him and to be appreciative of him. And this would cultivate a certain type of connection with him. They would know what it meant to be his children and for him to be their father. And now Jesus echoes this in the Lord's prayer. He says, give us this day our daily bread because God wants this deep, intimate connection where you walk in daily dependence upon him. So our first step is to ask. The second step with receiving God's provision, if you want to write it down, is to work. You ask and you work. Put in that work. When we're waiting on God to provide, there is work he wants us to do. Oftentimes we, we're focused on the destination and God is focused on the journey because in the journey there's this maturation process he has us on where he's conforming us and changing us and bringing us to become more like, like his son. And when I say work, I've noticed there's three different ways in which God has, has led me to work in my personal life that I'll share with you. This is what it, what it, it can mean more than this, but I've noticed three th these three things have always stood out to me as I've waited on the Lord's provision. The first one is work has meant obeying what I already knew. As I waited on the Lord and worked, my work was to be faithful with what God had already put in front of me. So instead of focusing on other things, on what you don't have, focus on what you already have, focus on what God has already provided, focus on what God has already clearly made known to you, and do that, and then trust him for the rest. And I wanna show you an example of that. Go to Genesis chapter 22. Genesis 22, verses 1 to 14. Page 10, if you have our Bible. Genesis 22, 1 to 14. Say amen if we're there. Amen. All right. It says, sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham... Here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took out the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. 
Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. All right. So remember, Abraham is in a situation where he needs God's provision. The plan that God has requires that this son of his has descendants. The problem is this son is being sacrificed. And so Abraham's in a spot where he needs God to somehow provide, and he's not sure how God is going to provide. This is very relevant to all of our situations. We're in times where we need God to provide, but we don't know how he's going to provide. And so what does Abraham do? Well, he doesn't do what he did 10 years ago. If you remember 10 years ago, he was in the same situation, waiting upon the Lord. And so in his waiting, he turned to control. He tried to control the situation. He started focusing on God's part instead of his part. He started focusing on God's part of the equation and controlling what God was supposed to do. And how did that turn out for him? Not good. Screws the whole thing up. So now here we are 10 years later, but you see growth in Abraham. He's learned. In this moment, instead of focusing on God's job, Abraham focuses on his job. Focuses on his job. As he waited for God's provision, he put forth his effort toward obeying what he already knew. And as he obeyed what he already knew, he was trusting that God, in his timing, would provide according to his needs because the Father always provides for his needs at the right time. Look at all of the action words that Abraham's doing that he's uh, obeying what he already knew he was supposed to do, okay? In verse 3, it says, He got up early. He loaded his donkey. He took his servants. He cut down the wood for the offering. He traveled three days. He hiked up the mountain. He built the altar. He bound his son. He raised his knife to slay the son. And in this moment, he still has no idea how God is going to provide in this moment. All he knows is that God told me to do this, and so I'm doing this, trusting that God is going to somehow work this out. And of course, God did, because God always works it out. God always provides for his plans. God always funds his costs. And I believe this is a picture of what it looks like for us to wait upon the Lord. Waiting upon the Lord means obeying what you already know you should be doing. So as you wait for that, that relationship or that job or that promotion or that breakthrough or that child, you obey what God has already made clear to you to do. Waiting upon the Lord means, means working, meaning obeying what you already know. But it also can mean, and here's the second one, waiting upon the Lord can also mean being still. Your work sometimes, as you wait, your work is to simply be still. Write down Exodus 14. Exodus 14, uh, verse 10. Exodus 14, verse 10, and I'm going to read to verse 14. Say amen if we're there. Okay. As Pharaoh approached the Israelites, sorry, as Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, was it because you were, there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us out to this desert to die? What have you done by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in this desert. Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the, del the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Okay. So Israel just fled from Egypt and the Egyptians are chasing them. So they've gotten out and now they've come to a, a, a dead end. The Red Sea is in front of them. And the Egyptian army is behind them. And they're in a place where they need God's provision. So in this moment, Israel needs God's provision. And what they did was they waited. Moses said, be still. Your, another translation might say, be quiet. Shut your mouth. 
Stop tripping and simply be still. And this is, this is what it is. At times, our work is to do what God wants us, you know, what we already know. But at other times, our work is to simply sit back and watch God do what only God can do. At times, our work is to simply watch God do a miracle. That's what it was for Israel. And this happens all throughout the Bible, actually. You can write down 2 Chronicles chapter 20. 2 Chronicles 20, there's a, a king named Jehoshaphat, and there's two armies that come against him. And so he goes and he cries out to the Lord for deliverance. And I'm paraphrasing, but God pretty much says, take your army, go to the other army, and just stand there. Literally. So they take the army, they go before the other army, and they stand there. And as they sing praises to God, God somehow causes the other armies to come into confusion, and they annihilate each other. So as they waited on God's provision, they simply were supposed to just watch God do what only God could do. You can also write down Joshua chapter 6. Joshua chapter 6 is the story of the walls of Jericho. There's this fortified city, and God's going to deliver them in the city, and pretty much they just walk around in a circle for a week, and then God does the rest. Right? So, so our job at times is to simply just be still. Let God be God and watch him work. Now, how do you know which to do? That's what's challenging. And a lot of times we want this formula. We want a formula of, okay, do this, this, and this, and this is how it will work out. But the, the problem with formulas is that they erase the need for a relationship. And that's why we want formulas sometimes. Just tell me what to do. and just, uh, God doesn't want that. He wants to cultivate this connection with him. And so whether you should be still or whether you should be doing something, that's going to be case by case that's going to come from you understanding God and connecting with him. But I will say this. I've noticed there's usually two camps of people. There's, there's one camp of people who are more inclined to sit back and do nothing. You're more inclined to say, I can't. More inclined to say, this is too difficult. More inclined to, 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 to not work. And so I often see that God wants to use in their lives, God is moving them to do something, to do what they already know they need to be doing. God wants to get them moving. But then on the other side of the coin, there's usually a camp of people who's more inclined to doing stuff. Can't sit still. Always seeking to make something happen. Love control. Can anyone relate? Yeah. And usually in those instances, when people are like that, God wants them to learn how to be still. That's the maturation that God wants for them, to learn to sit back, to trust, to release control, and let God be God in their life. But regardless of what camp you're in or how God is working, whether you're called to obey what you already know, or whether you're called to sit back and watch him work, God always wants us to be working on our personal growth. And that's the third thing. God always wants us, as we wait, to be focusing on personal growth, to be focusing on becoming something. Always. God wants to be, be as we wait for that job, or that relationship, or that spouse, or that child, or that promotion, God wants you to become something in that process. In that waiting, there's an opportunity for you to become more familiar with your brokenness. I'm gonna say that again. As you wait, God wants you to become more familiar with your brokenness, more familiar with your dysfunction, more familiar with the ways in which you don't trust him. And then he wants you to take that and bring that to him so that he can work on that and, and surrender that and, and transform you so that when the provision does come, you can handle it and steward it well. It's like in sports. You, you got the kid who complains because he's not playing, and you got the kid who works while he's not playing. And then the opportunity comes, and this kid's not ready, but this kid is ready because he's been working in the waiting. And that's what God wants for us. I truly believe that to be working on ourselves, growing in Christ's likeness, so that when the provision comes, we're ready to steward it in a way that is pleasing to him. So, talking about receiving his provision. First we ask, say ask. ask. Then we work, say work. work. Okay, third piece to this, and I'm oversimplifying this, but I'm just trying to give us some, you know, some parameters to start to process this thing of provision. We ask, we work, and then we worship, third one. Ask, work, and worship. When God provides for you in some way, your only appropriate response is to worship. It's to worship. 
And worship always begins, it begins with giving thanks. When God provides, we worship, and we worship by giving thanks. When you give thanks, at the core of what you're doing is you're acknowledging grace. That's what giving thanks is. So when you give appreciation to someone or appreciation to God, you're acknowledging that what has been done on my behalf was not owed to me. I was not deserving of it. I shouldn't be expecting it. And so I'm, a, I'm expressing appreciation because I'm acknowledging the grace that you've shown me. And I think that all of us can lean into this aspect of worship a little bit more, this concept of gratitude and appreciation towards God. Because if we, I don't want to generalize, but I'll gener, generalize for a moment. I think if you looked at the, I think our gratitude can often be pretty weak and pretty minor in comparison to the effort we put forth toward asking for something, if you feel what I'm saying. And so how often does somebody pray for two years, God, I need this for two years, and then God provides, and then you thank him for two minutes. You asked for two years, and you thanked for two minutes, or how often do we ask with passion and fervency, and then we thank him with apathy, with entitlement. Or we cry out to God for this blessing for, with, with tears, but then those tears are no longer present in our gratitude. I think all of us can lean into this a little bit more. What if we put the same amount of effort in thanking God that we did with asking of God? What if we prayed for a year and then we thanked him for a year? What if we cried as we asked, and then we cried when, we, when he answered? When we, when we wait upon the Lord for something, our proper response is to give thanks. But I believe God wants us to give thanks with the same amount of passion, if not more passion, than we did with when we asked of him. Worship starts with giving thanks, but then worship also ends with surrendering. You give thanks, but then you surrender. Two parts of worship. I receive it with gratitude, but then I surrender it back to God. Write down Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 2. Very popular passage. Romans 12, 1 to 2, which I'll read. It says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. This is your true and proper worship. Okay, therefore, in view of God's mercy, what does that mean? Therefore, in view of God's grace, in view of what God has done to you that he didn't have to do for you, in view of that, you're supposed to offer your body as living sacrifice. So in view of what God has done for you, you're supposed to surrender your life back to him. I believe that principle is all throughout scripture, and that principle applies to all aspects of gratitude and all aspects of provision. In view of what God has done for you, you give him thanks, but then you surrender it back to him. This is all throughout the scripture. This is what Abraham is doing with Isaac, surrendering it back. This is what Hannah did with Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 3. This is what the Israelites did with the first fruits. God blessed them with, with crops, and then the first crops were supposed to be given back to him. And it's what we're called to do as his children. When God blesses us, we say, God, I'm so appreciative of what you've done. Thank you so much. Now, here it is. I give it back to you. Use it for your plans. Use it for your purposes. This does not belong to me. It belongs to you. Have free reign with it. But once again, this is a challenge for us. It's a challenge for us because when we get what we want, we want to use it for what we want. We have sometimes, we have different plans than God had for what he gave us. So our plan was for that relationship or that marriage to make us happy. But God's plan was it for, for it to refine us. Or our plan was for that promotion to make our life more comfortable. But his plan for that promotion was to make you more generous towards other people. And sometimes we, 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 we pray for things and God provides it. But then over the course of time, it doesn't work out how we thought it would work out. It's a little more difficult than we thought it was going to be. It's a little more painful. It's not as smooth, and it's in those instances we have to take a step back and say, okay, God, maybe, maybe your plan for this was different from what my plan was for it. I'm still appreciative of it, so what I need to do is I need to just surrender this back to you. Have your way in this, 
I'm going to still steward this as best as I can. I'm going to still be appreciative of it. But I want you to refine me through it. Have your way. Have your way. It's not mine. It's yours. And when we do that, now, again, now we're offering ourselves as living sacrifices. It's not working out how we thought, but we're going to surrender to God no matter what. And what if we lived like that? What if everything God gave us, we thanked him for, and then we surrendered it back to him? Our bodies, our marriages, our children, our job, our finances. What if we lived like that? You know what we'd look like? We'd look like people who are offering themselves as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. We'd look like children of God, overflowing with gratitude and constantly surrendering unto him. In fact, I want to put this into practice right now. I want to take 30 seconds, okay? We want to lean into gratitude. This is going to be awkward, so just get over it. It's going to be awkward. I want us to all stand, and I want us to just give God thanks for the good things he's done in our life. Give God thanks for the good things. And I want us to say it out loud. Now, here's what's happening in a lot of you right now. I'm nervous. I'm going to sound weird. What if I run out of things to say? None of that, that. That is not the voice of God, just so you know. That's just not. It's not the voice of God. It's the voice of the enemy. So we're going to take, and not, not, with, not with passivity and boldness. Or, no, not with passivity. I want us to speak with boldness. Speak with authority. Thanking God for 30 seconds for the good things done in our life. Let's do it. Start. Amen. Let's give God a hand. Thank you, God. Thank you for the good things. Thank you for the good things. You can be seated. That's what it looks like to be a child of God. Even if you're not walking around saying it, you're walking around feeling it. You're just grateful because nothing you have was deserved. All of it was a gift of God out of his kindness towards us. So let's recap. We talked about a lot over the past couple weeks. If we're going to walk according to our identity as his children, that will require us to understand who we are in relation to him and the realities that should be flowing in our life because of that. But if we adopt mindsets that contradict who we are, it's going to, live us to, it's going to lead us to live contrary to who God made us to be. And some of those mentalities connect to resources that can lead us astray or a scarcity mentality, uh, an earner mentality, or an entitlement mentality. All of those ways of viewing resources can lead us to live contrary to how God wants it to be. So instead of those worldly mentalities, we need to adopt a kingdom mentality. And a kingdom mentality has four core beliefs to it, maybe more, but at least four. One is that God is my provider, which means that resources are unlimited because God's not broke, right? Doesn't mean he's going to give you unlimited resources, but it means that he's not scarce. God is my provider. God always provides for himself. What I have belongs to God, and what I have is because of his grace, not because I deserve it. And when we walk in those realities and with those core beliefs, we'll handle our resources and live closer in alignment with who God made us to be. But God's provision doesn't just mean us just receiving. There's an active part we have in his provision, and that starts with us asking of him. Why? Well, because asking creates a, a, a deeper connection with God. It allows us to be vulnerable before him, walk in humility before him, and stay in a moment-by-moment moment dependence upon him. So we ask, but then we work. Working can mean several things. Working can mean obeying what you already know. Working can mean sitting back and watching God do what he does. And working always means focusing on our own personal growth, our own spiritual growth. And after we ask and after we work, we worship. We give God thanks with the same amount of passion that we asked for it in the first place with. And then we surrender it back unto him. That's a lot. So now let's make this applicable to our lives so it's not just a sermon, but it's something that we can actually grow in. So here's a couple things to reflect upon for some soul work this week. First question to reflect upon and do business with God in. Are you regularly bringing your needs to God? Something to focus on. Are you regularly... Bringing your needs to God. 
and I'm talking specifically the needs you take for granted. We're pretty, you're, we're, we're pretty good with asking for the big stuff, but a lot of times we forget to ask for the little things. So are you daily asking God for daily bread, for energy for the day, for your food, for health? I want to encourage you to focus on praying for and asking for those little things. Because what's going to happen is when you, when, you start to, when you start to ask for your daily needs, you'll start to remember how much God is actually doing for you, how much he's actually providing for you. And it's going to create a stronger, it's going to cultivate a stronger connection with him. So are you regularly bringing your needs to God? First question. Second question reflect upon this week. If you are waiting on God's provision in some way, is there any form of waiting that you need to lean into more? So if you're waiting for something, might you need to obey what you already know? Or if you're waiting on something, might you need to sit back and let God be God? Or if you're waiting on something, might you need to focus on your personal growth? That's a yes to all of us, by the way. Or if you're waiting on God, might you need to, to work on surrendering something unto him? Okay, things to reflect upon. So we've looked at something to ask, the work, and then now the worship part. If God has blessed you with provision, is there an aspect of worship that you need to lean into more? So might you need to lean into gratitude a little bit more? Might you need to, to, to thank God a little bit more for what he's already done in your life? I mean, think about this. What if when we give gratitude to God, we don't want to fall into the trap of trying to earn it back? Like my gratitude doesn't earn anything back from God. Rather, it's an expression of my love and appreciation for what he's done. So what if you took an hour and you're going to sit in silence and you said, God, this sitting in silence is simply an act of my appreciation for what you've done in my life. Or if God blesses you with something, what if you took a vacation day, a vacation day off of work to simply show God appreciation? I'm going to, I'm going to not work today and I'm going to just sit and observe nature and consider this God as an expression of just my appreciation. You can do whatever you want as long as it's devoted unto the Lord. But the point is that what if we became more intentional with our appreciation of showing things to God that we're so appreciative, we're going we're, we're to do these things unto him. I think all of us, again, could lean into that a little bit more, sitting in gratitude a little bit longer. So is that you? Or regarding worship, might you need to surrender something unto the Lord more that he's provided? So maybe you're having trouble in your relationship. Maybe it's not working out as you thought. Maybe God had a different plan for it. Maybe there's a season where God wants to refine you through that relationship or through that job or through that whatever. Is there an area, did you pray God provided and it's not working out? Maybe you need to surrender it unto him a little bit deeper. So these are things to reflect upon. Now remember, as we close, our identity is what shapes our reality. And the point of all of these sermons is for us to understand who our father is and then understand what that means for our life. Understand the realities that flow as a result of our connection to him. So may this week, may we become more aware of our Father and more aware of the realities that flow into our life so that we can walk in a way that's holy and pleasing unto him. Amen? Amen. All right, let's pray. Father, we are so grateful, so grateful for your choosing of us Thank you, God. I just want to sit on that for a moment. Thank you, God, for choosing us. You chose us before we chose you. I don't care who we are. None of us came to you apart from you allowing us, apart from you calling us. No one came to you apart from your grace. Thank you, God. Thank you. Thank you for loving us and richly providing all things for our enjoyment. Thank you, God. Thank you for graciously allowing us to keep the blessings you've given us even though we don't always appreciate them. I confess on behalf of this body of believers that we don't always use the things you've given us for your purposes. Sometimes we use them for selfish reasons. 
Sometimes we start inserting ourself in the middle of the plan instead of keeping you in the middle of it. Please forgive us. And thank you for allowing us to still have it. Thank you for not ripping away the blessings you've given us because we didn't handle them right, but you've been patient with us. Thank you for fathering us with gentleness and long-suffering. Thank you for the health you've given us. Thank you, God. Health is such a blessing. Such a blessing. And even if we're battling something health-wise that is not ideal, thank you for the years of health that we had previous to this. That was a gift. Thank you, God. For those of us who are struggling in our relationships or marriages, hey, thank you for giving us a marriage in the first place. Even though we may not be doing it right, thank you for it. Help us to surrender it to you. Thank you for the jobs you've given all of us. No one in here has their ribs showing because they haven't been eaten. All of us are well fed not because we deserve it, but because you graciously let us be born into a country where that's not a thing. Thank you, God. Overwhelming grace you've shown us. Overwhelming grace for all of eternity, but also in the here and now. Thank you, God. Thank you for giving us a church that's safe, we're not gathering underground, worried about the feds coming to break in on us. We're worshiping free. We have a sign outside. Thank you, God. Let us not become soft because of your blessings. May our hearts become soft because of your blessings. Thank you for giving us a building that's comfortable, cushioned chairs. Thank you for all the people who gather week after week who love you who want to grow. I'm so grateful to be around people who want to grow in your grace. Thank you. Thank you, God. Help us lean into gratitude. Give us eyes to see your grace. We can't be grateful until we see the grace. Remove the entitlement from us. From the youth all the way up to the oldest person in here, all of us at times, we get entitled, thinking we're deserving of stuff. It's not true. Everything we have is out of grace. Thank you for it. Transform us. Make us into living sacrifices. Out of gratitude for what you've done. Thank you for the cross. For the cross. Thank you, God. So good to us. We love you. It's good to be your child. In Christ, name we pray. Everybody sit together. Amen.